I'm trying out uh, this uh, wooden pulpit. If you remember uh, back a year ago when we started holding advanced services, uh, I used this pulpit a number of times, but uh, I, I couldn't quite see the, um, the words on my page um, because of my eyes, but now I have progressive glasses. And uh, so I, I, I like the name progressive. It makes me feel progressive um, as opposed to uh, climbing over that hill. Uh, so I'm trying this out this morning and we'll see how it goes. My sermon title this morning is, is this, We Don't Need Another Plastic Toy. We don't need another plastic toy. And I, I chose that title because I remember a time, uh, yesterday was our oldest son's, uh, Daniel, it was his 18th birthday. And um, uh, yes, I'm wearing progressive glasses. And yes, I have a son who is old enough to vote. Um, uh, we were opening his presents yesterday and there was a bottle, a beer bottle sitting in, in the background where Heather was going to be taking a picture. And so we wisely decided to move the beer bottle because it was mine it, it, and it was empty. It was from the night before. And uh, so move that out of the way. He, that's next year, Josiah said. So... Um, Anyway, last night um, it was his, it was his birthday, and it brought to mind as I was working on the sermon this week a time many years ago when the the kids were the, the Daniel Josiah and Bethany were quite little, and we were visiting a dollar store, and I think we had given them a, a certain amount of money that they could each spend in the dollar store, and um, you know I think they may have been three, four, and five or something like that at the time, and so we're going around the dollar store, and you know the thing about dollar stores is they have a lot of stuff for sale, right? It's packed in a dollar store. I mean, they got to move a lot of product. The stuff costs a dollar. So they got to they gotta sell a lot of stuff. And so it's just packed with stuff. And little kids in a dollar store, I, I, I think they have very little discernment at that age. And so their eyes are big and they see all this stuff. And what we went home with, with that day were these cheap plastic pirate swords and cheap plastic cowboy silver six shooters with complete with the, the silver sheriff's star you put you, you clip onto your shirt and it's that kind of six shooter gun that breaks very soon and the kind of silver sheriff star that the clip breaks the first time you try to pin it on a five year old boy's shirt uh, nonetheless, I remember Josiah would run around with his flannel shirt with a pocket and he'd put the Sheriff Star inside the pocket because <laughs> that still was his badge of authority. <laughs> we read in Genesis that the very first man and woman, Adam and Eve by name in scripture, even though they had everything, they were deceived by the shiny lie that promised more. And their eyes got big and they reached for something God had not intended to give them. They reached for that promise of more and they found death instead. See, there are no treasures in a dollar store. There are no treasures in a dollar store. Listen to that passage that last week uh, Pastor Rob Teeson preached for us uh, from chapter 8, verse 31 to 38. In Mark chapter 8, verse 31 to 38. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed." 
when he comes in the glory of his fathers with the holy of his father with the holy angels as jesus said this imagine what the disciples felt I, I can just see as he's reading this, I can see their faces fall. The whole encounter with Peter, the, in, the words of Jesus saying, I'm going to be killed. And, and Peter saying, no, Lord, not you. You're the Messiah. You're going to rule. And Jesus saying, you get behind me. That's, that's not of God. That's of the devil. That's, that's a human thought you have there. I can just imagine the disciples' faces falling and their dreams crumbling. I mean, their, their hopes in Jesus just falling to dust. You got to see how this must have crushed their dollar store dreams. Their hope for something more on earth, not just in heaven. The thing is, a, a plastic silver sheriff star, it looks bright and shiny while it lasts. But that's the problem. It doesn't last. And Jesus, I want you to know, he, he doesn't want to take away our happiness. Even though it may feel that way at times, he, he doesn't want to take away our happiness. He just doesn't want us to settle for an imitation of the real thing. He doesn't want us to settle for what's counterfeit and fake. We have to die to dollar store dreams if we want to discover real happiness and the treasure that these hearts, yours and mine, were designed for, were wired for. We've got to let go of the one to gain the other. So Jesus says in verse 35 of chapter 8, whoever is going to try to keep his life is going to lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and for the gospels, he'll save it. He'll gain the real thing. Not the silver plastic thing, the real thing. Beginning in Mark chapter 8, verse 31, there's a turning point there for the whole gospel of Mark. Uh, it, it just cha Mark changes themes here. Jesus begins to talk regularly about what was going to happen to him when they got to Jerusalem. And the writer, Mark, he shifts his focus here at that turning point to, towards building that, toward that climax. It's like they're, from that point on, they're heading to Jerusalem. They're going up to the point of the whole Gospel of Mark. And from that point on, Mark shifts from the question he has been asking in the first eight chapters, who is Jesus? Who is this man? And all the signs and the miracles and the teaching that begin to reveal who Jesus is. From this point, Mark begins to shift to a new question. Why did Jesus come? What has he come to do? Look again at verse 31 of chapter 8. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. What's the key word there? What's the key word, the, most, the, 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 the turning point word that you see there? Hmm? Must. Hey, Maureen got it. You get a silver star. Yeah. Must. He must. Jesus tells them again in chapter 9, verse 31, and they were afraid to ask him what all of this meant. Look at verse 31 of chapter 9. For he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. But they did not understand the saying, and they were afraid to ask him. Again, still heading for Jerusalem, Mark keeps building to the climax of this book when in, in chapter 10, verse 32, Jesus' followers again are afraid. They're filled with fear. And he tells them these words in chapter 10, verses 33 and 34. See, we are going up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes. And they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. 
See, if this was a movie, I know what the soundtrack would be. If this was a movie, at the, from chapter 8, verse 31 on, you would begin to hear the, the sort of the, the, the gradually building, increasingly frantic strains of a cello. You know, in, 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 in. and you'd hear the, the building beat of a bass drum in the background. Boom, 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 boom. And you'd hear this tension begin to build from 8, verse 31. Okay, you're laughing, but you're supposed to feel tension right now. You would feel the tension begin to build. Do you, do you get what I'm saying? All the way from chapter 8, verse 31, through the rest of the book of Mark. Because it's going towards his death. What kind of a, a writer writes a book where half of the book is about the hero's death? Mark does that on purpose, and he does it brilliantly as a writer. Because that's the purpose for which Jesus came. And he's beginning to help us see that as readers. Just as the disciples really start to see who Jesus is in chapter 8. Just at that point when they begin to have their blinders come off and they begin to get it. Peter says, you are the Christ. Just at that point, Jesus heads them for Jerusalem. He turns them towards the cross and the inevitable conflict that's going to lead to his death. And for the disciples, you see, if they've got to be wondering. It's got to be just tearing them up. If Jesus is the Messiah that we've all been waiting for, if he's the, the, the next king that the whole nation has been waiting for, how is it that he's talking about dying? They don't know all that we know. So this is tearing them up inside, I think. They, the disciples must have felt like their dreams of a messianic kingdom were, were just crumbling, dying. Their hopes were dying before it was even the kingdom was even born. So Jesus tells his disciples he's going to give them a glimpse. He tells his disciples, I'm going to let you see something. I'm going to give you a, a taste, a foretaste, a vision. Not like a, a dream vision, but a sight of what's coming, of the coming kingdom. He's going to let them see something. Now look with me at chapter 9, verse 1. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Let me reread that with a bit of a, a shift of translation based on the grammar. And, and still a good translation. I'm just being a little bit more literal about the, the grammar. Truly I say to you, for some of those standing here, it's not even a little bit possible that they're going to even taste death before they see the kingdom of God having come in power. The first heading in, in today's message on, on this passage is just following the, the flow of the passage. And verse 1 of chapter 9 is really about the promise. It's a promise. This verse, verse 1, is often misunderstood. And so I, I want to show you four things. Being a, a person who reads um, very slowly, I take a long time to read a book. Heather's very quick. But it helps me notice little details as I read because I'm so slow at reading. And so uh, I see four things here that I want to show you to help clear up what this verse is saying. The first thing is just this. In verse 1, Jesus said, some, not all. Okay, so he's talking to a specific few of the disciples, not all of them. We're going to find out more about that shortly. The second thing Jesus says is, is he said, they will not taste death. Okay, that is in Greek, a, a double emphatic negative. The if you are a grammar geek, I know one of you is. I don't know about the rest of you, uh, maybe two of you. But uh, this is a double emphatic negative that it's not just saying this won't happen. That would be just a simple negative. This is a double emphatic negative based in the subjunctive tense, okay? Uh, and and uh, Gloria perked up, okay. So now you know who the other geek is. Um, and and what, this is, what Mark is doing here, he's not just ruling out something that will happen, he's ruling out something that even has the possibility of happening. 
He's ruling out any possibility of this happening. This is what he's saying in the Greek here. So, so that's the second thing Jesus says. It's not even, there's, there's not even an outside chance of, of some certain of these disciples tasting death before I give them this thing that I'm promising. The, and that leads me to the third thing is Jesus says they see the kingdom of God, okay? You see that there? There are some standing here. There's not even an outside chance of them tasting death until they see the kingdom of God. Not enter the kingdom of God, See it. And then the last thing, I guess there's five things. I'm adding one. Uh, having come with power. It's in the pluperfect tense, if you care about that, Gloria. Uh, and and uh, Jesus saying, you know, uh, there's not even an outside chance for a few of these disciples to, to taste death before they see the kingdom of God after it has come or having come with, in power. Let me put that together with my own paraphrase uh, and uh, why I believe that the next few verses fulfill all of verse 1 is because the sum are Peter, James, and John. The sum of those standing here in verse 1 are Peter, James, and John. That's in verse 2. Look at verse 2. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John. They were some of those standing there at the time. Okay? Moreover, they saw Jesus transformed before their very eyes and they glorified on that mountain. Look again, the end of verse 2 and verse 3. This is what they saw. Now, verse 1 said, some of you standing here will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Verse 2, and he was transfigured before them and his clothes became radiant, intensely white as no one on earth could bleach them. That's what they saw. What is that vision, what Peter, James, and John saw as predicted? What is that vision that Jesus gave them? What does it have to do with the kingdom of God? And how is what they saw a powerful manifestation having come in power? How is this vision a powerful manifestation about the kingdom of God? To help us understand that or answer that question, we have to understand both what Jesus means in this promise and why he said it. Now, uh, if you follow our Facebook page, I'd like to uh, um, include a little blurb on the Facebook page uh, for people who would be more skeptically minded and um, uh, critical thinkers who, who would very much doubt the Bible and not accept the Christian message. And I try to have a little blurb that will catch an interest or show that we actually take doubt seriously. We want to engage doubt and we want to help people wrestle through intellectually uh, the truth claims of the Bible. So what I brought up on Facebook was that there are many critics who will look at verse uh, 1 of chapter 9 and say, look, Jesus plainly said God's kingdom would come to Israel in their lifetime. And it didn't. They died. They did taste death. But see, Jesus' promise in 9 verse 1 is about the transfiguration of verses 2 through 8. That's my, that's my argument. The first reason why I say this is because of the way these verses are connected together. Look with me at verse 2. And after, what? After six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John. Why would he introduce how many days later it was unless Mark wanted us to know that Jesus made a promise? And after six days, he delivered. That's why the six days are mentioned, I believe. But there's a little bit more than that going on. Look at verse 2. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. Let me ask you this. When you look at the promise that uh, Jesus gave the disciples in verse 1, What's the great event that they were waiting for? What's, what's the great event contained in that promise that the whole nation of Israel was waiting for? Okay, specifically according to verse 1. It's mentioned there. What's the great big thing all of Israel is waiting for? Pardon me? 
Okay, how, how, does, how does verse 1 describe God's arrival there? The kingdom. They're waiting for the kingdom of God, right? So you read that all through the New Testament, that people alive at the time when Jesus was born, they were anticipating the kingdom of God. They were waiting for that. The coming of... With power, absolutely. The kingdom of God to come with power. What is a kingdom? A simple definition, just a really basic definition of a kingdom. Pardon me? A castle? Okay, good. Is that what you said, Claire? Okay. A ruler with subject? What kind of a ruler? A king. It's a king dumb. It's, it's a dumb that a king rules, right? I don't even know what dumb I think dumb means probably short for domain or something. So it's a domain ruled by a king. That's a kingdom. Who's the king? Pardon me? In verse 1, it's God, right? And now, what would Christians say in answer to that question? Who's the king? Jesus. How do we know Jesus is the king? See, that's the point here. That's the whole point here. How do we know that Jesus is the king? That's what the word Christ means. What the Hebrew Messiah means. Literally, the word Messiah means anointed. But in the context of the Old Testament, the word Messiah comes to mean that future king that God anointed to rule. That coming king that God anointed to crown, to set up above his domain for all his people to follow and serve. So the word Christ is just the Greek form of the word Messiah and is saying Jesus is the king. Mark 1 verse 1, the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the son of God. So Mark here is showing us that Jesus is the king. And that's what the disciples needed to see. They needed to see the coming of the kingdom in power. That is, when the king is revealed. And the second reason I say 9-1 is fulfilled by the transfiguration is because on that mountain, Peter and James and John saw Jesus revealed in power, honored, glorified, affirmed by the prophets, Moses and Elijah, affirmed by God himself as Christ, as Messiah, as King. The third reason I say the transfiguration on that mountain of Jesus fulfilled chapter 9 verse 1 is that Matthew and Luke, the other two gospel writers who write similarly in structure to Mark, Matthew and Luke also put the transfiguration event right after that same promise that we have in chapter 9 verse 1. They put the same order there. So you got the promise and you got the mountain. They do the same thing. So three gospel writers put it the same way. Look, you, if you care, you can look it up in Matthew 17, 1 and Luke 9, 29. And this shows that they understood this too. Matthew and Mark do something a little different here though. Matthew and Mark give us another detail to show us how important this transfiguration is for revealing who Jesus is and what he came to do with power and glory. In verse 2, Mark introduces this transfiguration with these words, after six days. After six days. Glance with me at Exodus chapter 24. Exodus 24, verses 15 through 18. Then Moses went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called out to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on top of the mountain in the sight of all the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. See, Moses, he, he began to go up the mountain, and after six days, God spoke to him. After six days, the voice of God came from the cloud. What Mark is doing here, I think, and many scholars agree, I, this was my idea, I found this in a commentary. Uh, Mark is saying, after six days, doesn't this remind you of Moses going up on the mountain and God speaking from the glory of the cloud? 
Mark's drawing a connection there for us because that's something commonly Mark does. He takes Old Testament ideas to help us make New Testament connections with them. When the disciples were afraid, when the disciples began to see their dreams fall apart and their hopes began to die, that Jesus was going to die and with him any hope they, they had that he might be the king for the kingdom. When the disciples are at this point of crisis, Jesus said it was not even remotely possible that for some of them that they would die before seeing a glimpse of the one who would make the kingdom a kingdom, of the one who would come in power to rule, of who he is and what he would come to do. He showed Peter and James and John who he was. He was revealed before them so that they could see in power that he is Messiah, Christ and King. Now that's why I think the transfiguration fulfills the promise. And now let's look at the transfiguration in, in some detail. The preview. So we had the promise and now we have the preview. Our hearts... Um, there's that old hymn that says, our, our hearts are prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Our hearts are nearsighted. Uh, we are incorrectly tuned to love dollar store junk. Aren't we? You know what I'm saying, right? We, we get all greedy about plastic junk that we can get our hands on now instead of the eternal treasures that we are supposed to wait for. Right? Do you know what I'm saying? We need to stand strong. That's what Christians are called to do. We're called to be people of hope. We need to stand strong and hold out for the real thing. But that takes strength and I'm weak. So where does that strength come from? The strength, I think, comes from catching sight of the worth and the glory of Jesus. That's what gives us perseverance to wait for the real thing. That's what the disciples needed at this point of crisis as Jesus turned them toward Jerusalem and began that journey toward his death. So Jesus gave them the promise to give them hope when he began to teach them that his death is the only way to get to the kingdom. There would be no kingdom if there was no cross. And that explains the transfiguration. It was a vision that would give the disciples strength to endure, to persevere, to hold on and wait for what Jesus said would come next. And what did Jesus say would come next? And after three days... He would rise from the dead. And then, long after the resurrection, what does Jesus tell us would come next? And you will see the Son of Man coming in glory with his, with the, from the Father and, and the holy angels. I've mis, misspoken the verse there, but you see it at the end of chapter 8. See, the transfiguration announced that Jesus was king and it did so with power and glory. And today we who believe, we look back on the resurrection like we do at Easter time. We look back on the resurrection for that hope to point us toward the future, to what God's still going to do. Because we look back on what God has done in raising Jesus from the dead and we know that that's just the beginning. He's not finished yet. That's what we do with the resurrection. And that's what the transfiguration is for with, for those disciples. Before Jesus died, they looked back on the revealing of Jesus with power and glory as the Messiah, as the coming King. They looked back on that transfiguration mountain for hope to endure and persevere as he was going towards his death and as he died. Because he said, you know, after three days, and I will come and I'll meet you in Galilee. They look back on that and we, after his death, we look back on the resurrection for the same purpose. We look back on the power of God revealed through Jesus, the king, to establish a kingdom so that we have hope to endure because we need hope to endure. We need to look back on the resurrection to see that death has lost its victory. 
Death has lost its sting. Death is not the end. So we need to wait and persevere for the return of the king. And I just love saying that because I love the, that book. I love that movie. Because of the kind of, yeah, okay, we won't talk about Tolkien. So faith is not hope in things that are invisible. Faith is not hope in things that are invisible. Faith is hope in things that are not seen yet. The promise of chapter 9 verse 1 was that in the transfiguration of Jesus, when Peter and James and John were on that mountain, their faith would become sight for a moment or two. When Queen Elizabeth dies, you know, her heir will be the crown prince until the day of his coronation. You understand that? When he becomes king at his coronation and the transfiguration announces Jesus as the crown prince of God's kingdom. Look with me at verse 4. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses and they were talking with Jesus. There appeared to them Elijah with Moses and they were talking with Jesus. Now it mattered that Moses endorsed Jesus. And that's what I think his appearance does. Moses endorses Jesus as the crown prince, as the coming king, the Messiah. Moses is the greatest person in the Old Testament. Ask anyone. You just have to ask them. If they've read the Old Testament, they're going to say Moses was the greatest person. You can take my word for that. Moses is a prophet who wrote the foundational scriptures. You know, the, the Jews often just refer to the first few books of the Bible as Moses. They don't even just call it by his name. It's Moses. And so Moses wrote the foundational scriptures, and he appears here as if to say, this is who I said was coming like me after me. This is the one that I told you would come, who would be like me. That's in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15. We'll read in a minute. And God's own words at the end of this appearance where God says, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. God's own words confirm that Jesus is the promised one. When he repeats, God repeats the same thing he said about Moses. God's quoting himself when he gave instructions to Israel about Moses. Look at Deuteronomy 18, verse 15. says, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, Moses is saying. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. See, it mattered that Moses endorsed Jesus. That Moses pointed people to listen to Jesus like God did to Moses for Israel. And it mattered that Elijah endorsed Jesus. Elijah, he's not the most important prophet in the Old Testament, but he's probably the most spectacular prophet in the Old Testament. If you look at all of Elijah's miracles, even though there's no book of the Bible named for Elijah, there, you just look at the, the pile of Elijah's miracles and there's, there's, they're second to none. I mean, he, he, he outperformed every other prophet, as far as I can tell, in terms of sheer volume and power of miracles. You might be able to debate that, but that's, uh, that's what I'm saying right now about Elijah. He's a spectacular prophet. And so it matters that, that Elijah endorses Jesus because Mark's readership knew Elijah as a forerunner of the Christ, knew that there would be a prophet like Elijah who would come before the Christ and prepare God's people for God's kingdom. They expected someone like Elijah in the tradition of Elijah some, as you look back at chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, even debated whether Elijah would be resurrected or um, something like that in order to prepare people for the kingdom. And Elijah appears with Jesus on the mountain as if to say, God's king has come. This is a display of power. It's like a show of force for Old Testament revelation. But Jesus is not just the king that God sent. See, the transfiguration could have stopped there with Moses and Elijah endorsing Jesus as Messiah, putting their names on the ticket, you know, so to to speak. 
Jesus could have just stood on that mountain and talked with these two prophets and still they would be pointing to him as Messiah and King. And that would be good enough. But Jesus was transfigured, transformed. The Greek word is metamorphosized. Metamorph- How would we say that? Metamorphosized? Something like that? Metamorphed? I don't know. You meta something. That's what the word is there, that Jesus was transfigured, transformed, metamorphed. Pardon me? Okay, Claire, ask Claire. Claire. Claire will tell you how to say that. See, the glowing white clothes, verse 3. The glowing white clothes, uh, whiter than it was possible to, to bleach them on earth, the, the, the writer says. This reminds Mark's readership of Daniel 7, verse 9, where God is described like that with white clothes that are so white. That's, that's a description for God in the Old Testament. See, the thing is that it's not just that the glory of God surrounds Jesus. What Mark is showing and the transfiguration reveals is Jesus is wearing God's glory. It's not just around him, it's, it's his clothes. It belongs to him. God's glory is the glory of Jesus we're being shown. And then God's words vindicate Jesus. God says, from the voice, from the voice, from the cloud says, my son whom I love. And in doing this, he elevates Jesus above every other person in the Old Testament or in the Bible who's ever been called a child of God. This is very unique and very special where God says, my son whom I love. He's not just like one of us. He's a son in a way that we are not. See, not only is God, Jesus, Heavenly Father, like Jesus taught us to pray, our Father who is in heaven. Not only is God, Jesus, Heavenly Father, God is Jesus' actual Father. I don't know how else to say that. His uh, biological doesn't seem right, but I think it's true in some way. In the same way that we are human because we have human parents, so we share their human nature. Jesus being the son of Mary, he shares her human nature, but Jesus being the son of God shares whose nature? Pardon? God's nature. So Jesus is both God and man, divine and human, all in this revelation. Because God sent his son, born of a virgin, to die for the sins of the world. That was why Jesus was born. He was born to redeem, born to set us free, born to die. That was the mission of the God-man. And the fact that Peter wants to camp out and put tents on the top of the mountain shows that Peter may have begun to understand who Jesus is, but not what he came to do. We cannot follow Jesus unless we understand the mission that he is his mission, the mission that he was on. And that's why God said, listen to him. Verse 8. If there's any words in this passage that are really worth paying attention to, it's these words. Listen to him. Right away, what does Jesus say to the disciples? Shh. Don't tell anyone what you saw here today. Because they needed to listen to him before they understood why he came. Which leads me to my next heading, the grace to persevere. There's a bunch of things that Mark does in the Gospel of Mark that just make me love him. Before I'd really paid a lot of attention to the Gospel of Mark, I, I never really thought much about John Mark, who's referred to a number of times throughout the New Testament. But having spent more and more time reading the Gospel of Mark, I like this man. I love his pastoral heart for people. He cares about shepherding the sheep of Israel. He cares about shepherding you and me and giving us encouragement and comfort. He shows this kind of concern in the way he writes chapter 9, verses 9 to 13. See, right after this mountaintop experience, the disciples voice their doubts in two questions, two key questions. They, they question the resurrection. That's the first thing. Look with me at verses 9 and 10. And as they were coming down the mountain, I mean, really, as they're coming down the mountain, you know what they just saw. 
And as they're coming down the mountain, they're not like, wow, what did we just see? Who is this Jesus? What has he come to do? Did you see what I, that was Elijah. And they're not even amazed, or Mark's not showing us their amazement at who Jesus is, at that he may be the king, the Christ, the, the Messiah. As they're coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. And so they kept the matter to themselves, questioning, and this is what they're talking about, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. We like to laugh at the disciples, but we're so much like them. They've got doubts. They don't understand. They're not getting it. They don't understand what this rising of the dead might mean. The promise of 9 verse 1 and what those three disciples, James and Peter, or Peter, James, and John, got to say it that way because I learned the rowboat song. You know the rowboat song? Peter and James and John. And, never mind. I'm not going there. These three disciples on that mountain, they see something that gives them hope before they had understanding. Let me say that again. They saw what they saw on that mountain gave them hope before they had understanding. Hey, I find that encouraging. Who here at times needs hope before we have understanding? I, I mean, how else are we going to persevere so that the understanding comes? How else are we going to persevere so that we don't keep reaching for the plastic toy? How else are we going to endure so that we wait for the real thing? We often need hope before we get understanding. And that's what Mark shows that Jesus gives Peter and James and John here. What does this resurrection mean? Well, he gave them hope to get through that. The second question they ask is a question about Elijah. So God gives them grace to persevere through this promise. And then they ask this question about Elijah. Look at verses 11 to 13. And they asked him, why do the scribes say that, the, that Elijah must come? That first Elijah must come. And he said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things. And, and he turns it around on them and asks them another Bible question. They ask him one, he's going to ask them one. So, and how is it? I lost my place there. Uh, how is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they pleased, as it is written of him. See, Jesus is talking about John the Baptist. Why did they ask this question? They weren't talking about John the Baptist. They were talking about, they just saw Elijah on top of the mountain, and it made them think, wait a minute, the scribes have always taught us that Elijah comes first, or, or someone like Elijah, to, to get people ready for God's kingdom. So, if you're the Christ, where's Elijah? Like, I think what they're saying here is they're saying, Jesus, you can't die yet. You can't die yet because first Elijah's supposed to come, get us ready for the kingdom. Then you can die one day after the kingdom's come. I don't know if they're quite saying that, but they're saying this isn't what we were taught. They're saying, hold on, Jesus. This isn't what we were taught. Until Jesus began talking about going to Jerusalem and dying, they had their hopes set on Jesus overthrowing the Romans any day now and declaring himself king of Israel. They're not quite ready to give up their old ideas that they gained from the way the scribes had taught them to understand the Bible. They're not ready to abandon their old thinking. They still saw the Romans as their biggest problem. And an earthly kingdom, a, a real kingdom, on the ground kingdom, looked pretty good and shiny to them. What they didn't yet grasp was that Jesus' kingdom could only come through Jesus dying to save us from our sins. They, they couldn't even understand that yet. The kingdom of God was going to be made up of a people who would... Not be perfect. Not a perfect people. 
a people like you and me, a people made up of sinners who are actually given forgiveness. This would be the people of the kingdom, a saved people, a redeemed people, a people being transformed, being made into the likeness of Jesus, not perfect, but forgiven. In spite of all of our doubts and our fears and our misunderstandings and our weakness and our sin of people like that, we would get to be in this kingdom and that kind of gracious kingdom could only come if Jesus died. That was Jesus' mission. That's what he came to do. So Jesus is like saying, you're right about Elijah. The Bible says that. But let me remind you, the Bible also says that the Son of Man must suffer. And not only that, but John has come. He did come to prepare people, not in the way that you were thinking, but in leading them to repent. John came and got people ready for this kingdom. John came and got people ready to hear the gospel, leading them to repent of their sins so that they could hear the gospel and believe it and enter the kingdom. John was the Elijah-like prophet God sent ahead of me. So if that's what Jesus is saying to the disciples here, to Peter and James and John on the way down from that mountain, then the way to God's kingdom is not by grasping the plastic star. It's not by, you know, buying the junk in the dollar store. It's not by reaching for the forbidden fruit. The way to the kingdom is the gospel. Look back at 8, verse 35. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. My friends, believing the good news that Jesus is God's king and his death saves us from the death our sins deserve. Believing this good news. Jesus told Peter, James, and John not to talk about what they had seen because they didn't understand yet what the kingdom was about, how the kingdom would come. They didn't understand the gospel. So what about us? What about us? Would Jesus say, shh, don't tell anyone what you've seen here? I have to ask, do you yet trust in Jesus' death as a substitute for your death? Do you yet trust in Jesus' death in your place, the death that you deserve for the sins that you have committed? I have to ask myself the same question. Do we understand that Jesus is who he said he is and what he came to do? Do we understand that yet? Do we yet trust in Jesus' death? Do we yet see that he is our substitute? That's, our, that's what we believe as a church, that he is our substitute. That's what gives us hope. It gives me hope when I need it so much. Like last night when my heart was filled with anxiety and the scripture came to back to me and God just said, Joe, hope in God. Hope in God. Look back to the glory and power of God's king seen on the mountain when he was transfigured. When he was shown as Christ and Messiah to the disciples. Look back to that and look back and remember the victory of his resurrection. The transfiguration was just a foretaste of the resurrection. Look back and remember the resurrection. Death has lost its sting. It's lost its victory. Death is dead. It's toothless. It can gum you, but it can't chew you. This is not something to keep to ourselves any longer. This is not something to be quiet about. This is something to talk about. It occurred to me, and I wanted to say this with you, not as by way of a prophecy, but just by way of encouragement that it may very well be that this week God is going to bring someone into your path who needs to know the hope that you have. God may bring someone across your path this week who needs your hope. So Father, as we trust that Jesus is the King, that Jesus has been 
not only crowned as prince, but now has taken a seat on the throne of your, of your, of your own throne to rule. Lord, as we trust that Jesus is the king who now does rule and is coming again to claim his kingdom. Lord, I pray that you will give us strength and faith through hope to endure when we need it. Hope to endure so that we can learn. Hope to endure so that we can turn away from the plastic toys. Hope to endure so that we can begin to grasp the real thing and not experience a kind of a superficial happiness that's just there for a moment. But Lord, through hope to experience the kind of joy that lasts forever. Because our treasure is Jesus Christ. And we worship him and bless your name. Amen.